Okay, welcome everyone to my talk about the central levels problem. The research I'm presenting today is joint work with Peter Gregor and Andra Mitschka, both from Prague. This talk is about the n-dimensional hypercube Qn. This is a very famous um, family of graphs parameterized by some integer n. What are the vertices of this graph? We look at all binary strings of length n and we connect two such binary strings with an edge if and only if they differ in flipping only a single bit. So what you see in this figure is an example how this graph looks like for n equals 3. And uh, for the purpose of this talk we always arrange the vertices of this graph into levels where the kth level contains exactly those strings with Hamming weight k. So those strings that have exactly k many ones and therefore n minus k zeros in them. So on level zero there's just a single string, namely the all zero string, and on the highest level there's only a single string, namely the all one string, and in between you have all the other levels k from zero up to n. This graph, this family of graphs, is uh, very important in computer science and discrete mathematics, and I will later on many, mention many applications where this graph um, pops up. It's basically omnipresent wherever, wherever you look. And there's also a number of very famous and prestigious problems connected to this hypercube. So, for instance, there's been this sensitivity conjecture due to Nizan and Segedi, which was famously proved recently by Huang. There's also Erdős and Guy's crossing number problem. And there's a very nice conjecture due to Furedi, which talks about partitioning the cube into chains of equal size. And the last example is um, Rusky Savage's problem on extending a matching in the cube to a Hamilton cycle. I will later come back to this last problem. In this talk we specifically focus on the topic of Hamilton cycles in the hypercube and um, not only in the whole hypercube but also in subgraphs of the cube. And when you hear people talking about Hamilton cycles in the cube, then they sometimes refer to this as a gray code. So a gray code is a cyclic listing of binary strings, and in each step you just flip a single bit, which is nothing else than a Hamilton cycle in the cube, shown in this example with the, with the red edges. And below it you see another representation of a gray code um, in this black and white encoded picture. So each row encodes a bit string, the white boxes are the zero bits and the black boxes are the one bit, one bits. And as you go through it from one row to the next you only change the color of a single of a single box. Gray codes have a large number of applications, for instance in signal processing, circuit testing, data compression, also experimental design, and also in puzzles. When you talk about the Towers of Hanoi problem or the Chinese rings problem, then solutions to these puzzles have very deep connections to gray codes. And a lot of this material is covered in Knuth's book, The Art of Computer Programming, in the most recent volume 4a. You find a lot of interesting stuff about this. Um, the notion of a gray code was named in honor of Frank Gray, who proved this result, which is now basically folklore result, which is saying that the cube QN has a Hamilton cycle for every value of n at least 2. And this particularly nice construction that he came up with, this particularly nice Hamilton cycle, this is sometimes called the binary reflected gray code. In fact, the black and white picture you see here on the slides, this is exactly the binary reflected gray code for n equals 3. So the focus of this talk, since we have now seen this classical result which talks about the whole cube, is now on subgraphs of the cube. So the subgraphs of the cube we want to look at are subgraphs that you get by looking at a sequence of levels. Yes. So one famous instance of this is the middle levels conjecture. For this you look at the cube of odd dimension, 2m plus 1, and there are two unique levels of maximum size, m and m plus 1 in the middle. And you only look at the subgraph of the cube induced by these two middle levels and you ask, is there a Hamilton cycle? And the conjecture says that it should be. And um, this conjecture was raised in the 80s by Havel and Buch and Wiedemann. And it has a long history. 
and was finally solved um, four years ago. And more recently, we presented a simplified proof for this conjecture. So it's not a conjecture anymore, it's a theorem. There is a Hamilton cycle between the middle two levels of the odd dimensional cube for every m. And now we look at the central levels problems, which in a very natural and very nice way generalizes this middle levels conjecture. So instead of just looking at the middle two levels, we look at any even number of levels around the middle. So we look at the middle two levels or the middle four levels or the middle six levels and so on. So this L is a parameter here. For L equals one, you just look at the middle two levels. For L equals two, we look at the middle four levels and always we ask, is there a Hamilton cycle in this subgraph that we get? For L equals three, we would look at the middle six levels and so on. And if you go to the extreme case, when L is M plus one, then basically you look at the entire cube, yes? So you ask, does the entire cube have a Hamilton cycle? So in this way, this central levels problem is a very nice interpolation between the middle levels problem, so the middle two levels, and the binary reflected gray code where you look at the entire cube. It looks at all the intermediate cases. And let's, let's, let's see what is known about this central levels problem. This was raised in the many papers by Savage, Gregor Krakowski, and also in a paper by Shannon Williams. This was at the time when not even the middle levels uh, result was known yet. So they, um, so these the, 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 these guys raised a very, um, a very um, brave conjecture at the time. What's known? Well, in the meantime, we know the middle two levels. There's a Hamilton cycle, so L, is, L equals one is a solved case. Two years ago at ICAMP, we extended this result to the middle four levels. We showed that also in the middle four levels you have a Hamilton cycle. On the other extreme, I told you it's known that the whole cube has a Hamilton cycle. Just take the binary reflected gray code. It's also known that if you cut away one vertex on each side, so if you cut away the all zero vertex and the all one vertex, it's known you can have a Hamilton cycle in the rest. Gregor and Kratowski extended this one more step by showing that you can cut away two levels on each side and you still have a Hamilton cycle in the rest. The entire range in between was not known up to this point. And um, the main result of this paper is to settle the central levels problem in full generality affirmatively by proving yes, for any odd dimension to m plus one, you can have a Hamilton cycle through the middle two L levels for every possible value of L that you want. So we completely settle this, this problem. We have the following very nice corollary which talks now about any dimension n. For any dimension n, look at the cube qn, and now look at any sequence of L consecutive levels. These levels need not be consecutive around the middle. And then we show in each of these cases, you can have something that is an almost Hamilton cycle. So why do we not uh, prove that there is a Hamilton cycle in all the cases? Well. There's a little imbalancedness problem in general that I will want to talk about now. So look at any sequence of levels, not necessarily around the middle, and look at all the even levels and all the odd levels. Then this is a bipartite graph, yes? So all the even levels are one partition class and all the odd levels are another partition class. If it happens that these partition classes don't have the same size, then you cannot have a Hamilton cycle in the graph, yes? So, and in general, this will be the case. In general, the two partition classes don't have the same size and then you cannot have a Hamilton cycle. However, you can have something that comes as close to Hamilton cycle as you can hope for. And this relaxed notion is then what we call an almost Hamilton cycles. I don't go into details how exactly this is defined, but you can define it in a meaningful way and then you can prove that these structures always exist. The perfect Hamilton cycle can basically only exist in these cases that the central levels problem talks about. So odd dimension and levels around the middle, then you can have a Hamilton cycle. This is what I, what we proved before, what I showed you on the previous slide. The main tool in our, in our paper um, are symmetric chain decompositions. So this is a notion that has been heavily used before in POSET theory and in many other applications. And uh, I will now 
explain this concept using a graph theoretic language. So what is a symmetric chain? We look at the cube of dimension n and uh, a chain is a path that goes monotonically across the levels and picks one vertex from each level, like you see in this, in this figure. And the chain is symmetric if the starting and ending level are symmetric around the middle. So if it is chain starts at level k, then it should end at level n minus k. This is a symmetric chain. And uh, a symmetric chain decomposition means that every vertex of the cube is contained in exactly one such symmetric chain. Yeah, so very short chains and you have very long chains. The longest chain always goes from the all zero string to the all one string. Yeah, this is a special chain. And the fact that the cube Qn has such a symmetric chain decomposition for all n, this is again a very well-known result. You can prove it in many ways. And there's a particularly nice construction to build such an SCD due to Green and Kleidmann. So in the 70s, they came up with a particularly nice explicit construction to build such a symmetric chain decomposition. And their construction, Green and Kleidmann's construction, can be used in many, many ways to prove many, many other nice things. You can use it to prove the existence of nice symmetric Venn diagrams. You can prove something about the little Offert problem and you can learn Boolean functions. So these SEDs due to Green and Kleidmann, they have a large number of nice applications. Now you may wonder, this talk is about Hamilton cycles. So what do Hamilton cycles have to do anything with SEDs? Like what is the connection? In fact, Streib and Trotter were the first to establish a connection between SCDs and Hamilton cycles and the cube. What they showed is the following. They showed that in the cube Qn for any n, you can have a symmetric chain decomposition. You can have an SCD that can be extended to a Hamilton cycle. So what does that mean? Let me show you a slightly different visualization of an SCD. So here I've drawn all the chains uh, in a straight way and um, I've arranged them in a particular way that, that will make sense in a moment. And what does it mean that such a decomposition of chains can be extended to a cycle? Well, it means that you can basically go up one of the chains and then jump to the next chain, go down the next chain, go up the next chain, and always jump alternatingly at the top and bottom ends of these chains. And in the very end, you jump back to where you started and in this way you get a cycle. So this is what it means that an SCD can be extended to a Hamilton cycle. And Streib and Trotter proved that this can always be done. However, they proved this in such a way that they described a new SCD. So they specifically constructed an SCD that can be extended to a cycle. And their SCD is not this very nice green Kleidmann SCD uh, that I talked about before. So the question is, can we extend also this nice green Gleitmann SCD to a cycle? And uh, this is our second main result, which says, yes, you can take the nice green Gleitmann SCD and you can order the chains and then alternatingly go back and forth between them so that what you get is a Hamilton cycle and this works for every n. We have the following very brave conjecture. In fact, we conjecture that it doesn't matter which SCD you start with. We conjecture that Take any SCD of the cube, you can always extend it to Hamilton cycle. Yeah, this is a very brave conjecture. The evidence we have are just these two SCDs, the one from Streib and Trotter and the Green and Kleidmann. These two can be extended. In general, we don't know. And uh, it's a challenging and interesting open question. It's nice. It's a nice analog to this rusky savage problem that I mentioned in the beginning, which talks about extending a matching to a cycle. And here we talk about an SED extending to a cycle. So I think these two problems are both uh, challenging and interesting. So what about efficient algorithms? Um, this proof of our first main result, the proof of theorem one, which says that there's a cycle through the middle to a levels of the cube of what dimension. This proof is constructive. Yes, we co explicitly construct these cycles and uh, the proof immediately gives rise to an algorithm to compute this, this cycle, to compute this gray code. And the running time of this algorithm is polynomial in the size of the graph. However, 
the size of the graph is of course exponential in m, exponential in the dimension of the cube. So in, in terms of complexity uh, measured in terms of m, this is a bad algorithm, yes. And this is basically one of the open questions uh, that, we, that, we, that we don't know how to answer, how to get an efficient local algorithm. So local algorithm means polynomial in m, so basically the algorithm just looks at the current bit string and based on that it knows what bit to flip to get to the next one. Ideally you should do this in constant time for each flipped bit and ideally only in linear space in m. So you basically only need the current bit string. This is the ideal thing and this is very far away, we don't know how to do this. On the other hand, let's look at theorem 2. So this was saying that you can extend the green kleidmann SCD to a Hamilton cycle. This proof is also constructive and this proof does give such a very nice local algorithm. So the algorithm we get is constant time, worst case, um, for each bit being flipped and the space it needs is only linear in the dimension. So it's really optimal in every aspect that you can hope for. And uh, this letter algorithm we implemented in C++ and we invite and encourage you to play around with it on the combinatorial object server. So on the link stated here on the slides, you can find uh, this, this algorithm and you can have visual um, visualizations of, of the gray codes generated by this algorithm. So these two pictures you see here are generated on the website. So please have a look and, and play around with this, with this algorithm. In the remainder of this talk, I will briefly um, talk about the main ideas that go into proving these, these two theorems, yes? And I want to start with theorem one. So this was cycle through the middle to a levels of the cube of odd dimension. This is a constructive proof and the construction proceeds in two steps, yes? So the first step is we build a collection of disjoint cycles through all the vertices of the graph. This is sometimes called a cycle factor. So we don't immediately aim for one cycle, but for the moment we just aim for many cycles and they should be disjoint. And this is exactly where the SEDs come in. So this is the crucial point where we now connect SEDs to Hamilton cycles. Okay, so here is where the SEDs enter the picture. We use SEDs to build this cycle factor. So we start exactly in this way. We start with the symmetric chain decomposition, but this is what you see in the figure, these, these red chains. And we look at the middle two L levels that we are interested in, yes, of the cube of our dimension. And uh, so we start with this SCD, and the first thing we do is we throw away all the edges that go beyond the range that we are interested in. So we only look at the SCDs restricted to the middle two L levels. Now remember that the dimension of the cube is odd and the number of levels around the middle is even, this means that all of these chains through the middle levels have odd length. So all of these red paths that you see, they have odd length. The shortest ones are just single edges. The next ones, they have length three. The next ones have length five, seven, and so on. So all these red paths that you get from the SED, these are paths of odd length. This is crucial. It means that from each of these odd paths, you can omit every second edge, or put the other way, you can take every second edge, every other edge, and this way you get a perfect matching. Yes. So let me go back and forth between these two pictures. Yes. So omit every second edge, and this way you get a perfect matching. Remember, all the paths had odd length. This is why you get a perfect matching by omitting every second edge. So now we have one of these perfect matchings. We have this red perfect matching that is called M1 here. Now we just do the same thing again. We take another SED. We take a blue symmetric chain decomposition, which doesn't have any edges in common with the red one. Of course, you need to prove that this exists, yes, but assume that you can do this, then you can do the same thing again. Omit all the edges that go beyond what you're interested in, take every second edge in the middle, and take, get a second perfect matching, M2, which is shown in blue here. Now, what did you get? Well, every vertex of the cube in the middle now is incident to one red edge and incident to one blue edge. So this is a collection of cycles, yes? This is your cycle factor. Just take the union of these two matchings. 
This completes the first step. Now we have a collection of cycles. There's a little problem here, of course, now that, as I mentioned, these, uh, this may not be a single cycle. In this example here, we see four cycles. We see a blue cycle, a yellow cycle, a green cycle, and a brown cycle. So there is still work to do, right? We want to come up with one cycle. We, we are not happy with four cycles. We want a single one. So what do we do? This is what happens in the second step. In the second step, we join these many small cycles to one. And uh, the joining works in steps in the following way. Consider two cycles from the cycle factor drawn here in gray on the slides. What we are looking for is something like this. And this is what we call a flipping four cycle. So a flipping four cycle has two edges in common with these two cycles. So one edge with, in common with one of the gray cycles and one edge in common with the other gray cycle. And this means that the other two red edges must go between the cycles. And why do we call this a flipping cycle? We call it a flipping cycle because now you can remove the two common edges and only keep the edges between the cycles and this will join the two cycles to one. So we preserve the property of having a cycle factor, but we decrease the number of cycles by one. Yes. And now you just repeat this. Yeah? Repeat joining two cycles at a time. Each time the number of cycles drops by one and now you keep, keep doing this until you have one cycle. For this you need, of course, many of these flipping four cycles. In this example, we started with four colorful cycles. This means we need three of these flipping four cycles to join the thing. And important here, these flipping four cycles must all be edge disjoint, otherwise it won't work. Otherwise these joinings may interfere with each other. So this is the main technical contribution here. To build all these cycles, to build the flipping four cycles and to make sure that they are all edge disjoint so that this joining happens without interference. So this is everything I want to say about this proof. Of course, now there are many details to be filled in. Um, but at, um, on the level that I explain it here in this talk, that's, that's all I want to say. Now let me briefly talk about the second theorem. This was about a cycle that extends the green kleidmann SCT to a Hamilton cycle by going alternatingly up and down these chains. So how do we prove that? The proof here is very different we do induction. The only special thing here is we do the induction in two steps. So we go from dimension n to dimension n plus two. This means we have a separate induction for the even dimensions and a separate induction for the odd dimensions. And there's a slight differences in how you do with these two cases. Again, the level of detail that I'm explaining here on the slides, it doesn't really matter what is this difference. The pictures I've shown you here are for odd dimensions, like all these chains, these red chains that you see here, they have odd length. And now we go from odd length to the same odd length plus two. Yes. So how, is, how does the induction go in principle? Well, the first thing we do is we look at the chain ordering in QN, and we have a rule that produces from each chain in QN four new chains in Qn plus two. Yeah, so each of these chains gives rise to four new chains in Qn plus two. There's a little special case here with chains of length one, which only give rise to three new chains, but all the other chains, they give four new chains. And by the way that we construct these, these four descendants for each guy, um, we already know that inside of each block of four descendants or three descendants, there are these top and bottom connections that we want. So inside each block, the chains are built in such a way that they are connected in this way alternatingly at the top and bottom end. And the only thing we still need to prove is somehow the cross connections between the red blocks. Yes. So we have to have a lemma that says, if you have a connection at the top or bottom between the chains in QN, then this connection translates to a connection also in QN plus two, yes, between the blocks. Of course, now you need to add more details, like what are these rules under which you can guarantee this? And this can all be done, and then you get exactly um, what you need. Like this is a very, very um, explicit and very simple, after all, construction that gives you all the, all the things that you, that you want. Now, let me finish with some open questions. 
One of them, both of them I mentioned already before. Let me reiterate these two questions. The first one is, we want an efficient algorithm, efficient local algorithm for computing a gray code through the middle to a levels of the cube of odd dimension. So ideally we want an algorithm that takes only constant time to know what is the bit to be flipped in each step. And ideally it should take only linear space, like only store the current bit string basically. Um, we are very far from it being able to do this. The only thing we can do is this exponential algorithm, exponential in N. Um, yes, so this is a challenging open question. The second question is this conjecture that we raised about SCDs. Is it true that every symmetric chain decomposition can be extended to Hamilton cycle? We have no idea. We showed that this is possible for the green kleidmann SCD. It's also known that you can do it for Streib Trotter, but in general, we don't know. And um, these are the two interesting questions. What I wanted to say about the last one, as I said, it's analogous to the Rusky Savage problem. Rusky Savage asks about does every matching extend to Hamilton cycle? And here we ask, does every SCD extend to Hamilton cycle? So I think you can um, you can see these two problems next to each other and um, see some similarities and maybe also techniques solving one will maybe help to solve the other one. That's all I wanted to say. I thank you for your attention and now I'm looking forward to any questions that may come up in the question and answer session. Thank you.